Namaste. Typography Society of India welcomes you to the talk on artificial intelligence and design the way forward. Today, we have Mr. Surin Parsule. He's a senior uh, professional with Microsoft. He has made significant contributions in the field of artificial intelligence. An alumnus of IDC School of Design, IIT Bombay, Surat has got more than 15 years of experience in the technology industry. He has a wealth of knowledge and expertise in areas such as cloud computing, software development, and artificial intelligence. He's also worked a lot in the areas of strategic thinking, and he is known for his ability to lead and motivate teams across different platforms. During his time at Microsoft, Suhirid has worked on several high-profile projects, including the development of cutting-edge software solutions and deployment of complex cloud infrastructures. Over the last few months, all of us have been exposed to different applications of artificial intelligence like Chat GPT and DAL E and a lot of other platforms, which claim to do a lot of things which we do in real life, including content management, writing, editing, doing its own research, creating a research paper, designing things, and creating images. Designers have always wondered where our skills and our professional um, world will be affected by this kind of artificial intelligence. This talk comes at a time the right time when the entire world is looking towards this interaction between artificial intelligence and human creativity. This talk will explain some of the concepts behind artificial intelligence and throw light into this mystery in our minds, how much artificial intelligence can affect human creativity. I would like to, on behalf of the Typography Society of India, I would like to Thank Mr. Sourith for agreeing to give this talk. I would also like to thank our technology partner, hasgeek.com, for giving all the support we needed to get this event organized in online mode. And I, would like, I want to offer a warm welcome to all of you for this lecture. Jai Hind. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Sourid. I'm a PM at uh, Microsoft. I work in the Azure Cognitive Services team. Uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, the latest developments in the space of AI and their impact on the design industry and profession. So we're here right now in March of 2023 and the last few months have been really exciting on account of the launch of what we call large language models, uh, specifically is those developed by OpenAI, who is an exclusive partner of Microsoft. These models uh, whose names are GPT-3, ChatGPT, DALI, et cetera, um, and their integration into mainstream uh, products such as Bing Search and Windows has caused a lot of excitement. Um, and these, uh, you know, changes are expected to uh, really, um, you know, shape many job roles and, and influence the way we work going forward. Now, design industry and design work will be no exception to this. And that's the topic of today's um, talk, which is to understand how these latest breakthroughs in AI are going to be shaping or um, should we say shaking up the world of design, right? How will design roles evolve in the years to come? And what should we expect in terms of these changes? Um, I will try and touch upon most of these topics in the rest of this presentation. The structure of the talk is fairly simple. I'll uh, let's start with getting a taste of uh, you know what's the latest uh, in this space. So demos. It's always uh, great to start with demos, and then we um, will. Uh, get a little crash course, you know, a, a, a background on AI, learn some of the key terminology and definitions, uh, you know, to develop a shared vocabulary, after which uh, section three will be about um, talking about the world of AI as it was till just a while ago. Um, 
and and number four is basically where we focus on uh, generative AI and the latest uh, tech breakthroughs in the space. Lastly, uh, some reflections in, in section five on uh, what to expect in terms of the evolution of design work and what working with uh, uh, AI uh, would be like as a designer. That's what we touched upon in section five. So let's jump right in. So um, we've seen uh, intelligence, uh, you know, intelligent text responses. We've seen uh, text generation and text to image. Here is a video of a um, text to animation plugin I, I recently found uh, that I thought was very cool. So let me play the video first. So as an alumnus of IDC, um, you know, I remember, uh, I remember, um, you know, just how much hard work uh, it was to, um, you know, uh, develop uh, an animation film. And I, I remember my colleagues, uh, you know, spending uh, late nights and, and hundreds of hours on their uh, films. So basically the fact that you can now have animation created with uh, just a couple of you know simple text prompts is, is pretty uh, you know mind blowing and and shows just how far we've come um so after that we um again now this particular um idea is basically uh, something we're all familiar with we've seen ai generated imagery that's um that's well you know experienced and understood by all of it but but um but the point of this slide is just uh, how far reaching the implications of tech uh, of this technology will be right a lot of the outcome of ai is actually highly usable high quality concepts and imagery and um, simple visualization is now being democratized right and so if for example my wife and i want to remodel our house soon there will be tools available for us to generate high quality visualizations uh, for ourselves right and 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 so that's really a step change in how uh, things were done, um, you know, um, uh, until a while ago and, and, and what's to come in the future. So uh, high quality generated imagery is, is really going to, uh, you know, shake things up in a big way. And this uh, actually next slide is a, a, a very powerful illustration. It's uh, taken from the Google party uh, image generation model page, and it shows how a simple instruction, which is at the top of the screen, in green can uh, you know be interpreted very differently by different size models um, now what are these different size models we'll get into that a little later in the deck but but you can see how as models evolve in their uh, you know scale and complexity uh, their ability to parse uh, different parts of the prompt say for example understand what a kangaroo is what a sydney opera house looks like you know what blue sunglasses you know, should be rendered like etc. to the point where from the first to the last image, there is a, you know, a, a sweeping change uh, uh, we can see in terms of quality, right? And and it's pretty mind blowing how um, how impressive that last image is and, and just where we are in terms of the state of the art. One last demo. Um, this is apparently a product launched by Meta um, sometime back and it's called Make a Video. Uh, I can guess uh, you probably can imagine, you know, how this works, uh, but let's uh, roll the video and, and take a look. So we got surreal, realistic, and we got stylized. Hyper-realistic spaceship landing on. And again, we can get some kind of 
ideas. An emoji of a baby panda wearing a red hat, blue gloves, green shirt, and blue pants. That's pretty crazy. Clownfish swimming through the coral reef. A young couple walking in the heavy rain. And then the horse is drinking water. Cool. Surreal. Let me pause that, but um, just the point is, you know, we need to remind ourselves that these are all, um, you know, visuals that are generated, which means that um, that they um, are not actual video. And so some of the, in fact, the videos in the realistic category are, are, are shocking, right, in terms of how good quality they are. So again, images being generated by simple text prompts, it's, it's uh, pretty mind-blowing. Robot dance. So, yeah, I mean, um, this is going to be now, um, you know, the the intro to AI. So, we will basically uh, build a bit of a foundation, uh, just get a sense of um, uh, uh, some some background context before we jump into sections uh, three and four. Right? This this particular slide uh, actually, you know, is uh, meant to ground AI. Uh, and and sort of underscore just how deeply infused it is into our daily lives, right? We're using AI um, uh, several times a day, even without uh, you know realizing it. And and it is um, got some very pragmatic uh, you know applications in our daily life. And we probably cannot imagine living without AI right now. Unlike say, for example, other technologies like crypto or blockchain, etc., which are still undergoing cycles of evolution and are not quite stable or proven technologies yet. Um, AI has very much been mainstream for decades now and, and has, you know, infused deeply into all of our lives. Um, some other examples that might not be as evident is um, how AI is in uh, action uh, or in, in the broader economy. And so, uh, just look at these examples from plastic recycling to nuclear fusion research to medical diagnostics and drug discovery. AI is playing a key role in in most of the uh, you know uh, key uh, research areas uh, that that folks are working on, right? So the hype around AI is is sort of justified given the impact it's having on the broader world. Um, this slide is also uh, you know meant to uh, give us uh, helpful visuals to keep in mind because any talk of AI will generally, you know, also involve some mention of the the powerful semiconductors that are helping, uh, you know, develop these uh, new models. And so, for example, the NVIDIA H100 is the latest in a series of these chips which contain Right. And second on the right is actually uh, the transformer model, which comes from a scientific paper that was published a couple of years ago. And and the transformer model is, uh, you know, attributed as one of the seminal breakthroughs that has helped, uh, you know, achieve most of, you know, what recent AI achievements you and I have seen. Okay, so this was a very uh, important paper uh, and, and design that, that a team of six came up with. And uh, really, yeah, is at the heart of all of the AI that we're going to be uh, seeing in the slides to come. Awesome. One last slide. Uh, this has got some very uh, useful definitions um, and uh, terminology. So let's take a look. Uh, let's start with neural network. Uh, so that is nothing but a computer system designed to function like the human brain, right? So you can see it has all these nodes and it has all these pathways connecting it. That's pretty much how our biological brain is also wired and and it, that's what gives it these um, you know human like capabilities because it's modeled around a human brain and so what do you do with the neural network you feed it uh, training data right and so think about if you're trying to build a model that recognizes pictures of cats and dogs you can feed it pictures of cats and dogs and and the model sort of learns it right and how does it do it by with the help of machine learning which is basically a a way of developing algorithms that uh, allow machines to learn and change in response to new data, right? Like so, uh, the more pictures of cats and dogs you feed, uh, the the better the the algorithm gets, right? And all of this leads to the creation of a, a model. And 
we basically are, uh, uh, this is think of this as the final finished product. And, and when we refer to AI uh, models, these are the finished products that, uh, you know, that you and I use. Okay, there's one more important definition, which is that you can either be feeding the neural network labeled uh, images of here is a cat and here is a dog, or you could basically be um, using unsupervised learning, which is just that you dump a bunch of images into the neural network and it figures out the uh, Yeah, so data and neural network together build the model, which is the final finished product, uh, after which um, there would be some testing, usually to understand if the model works as expected, and uh, productionizing of the model, which basically is uh, converting it into a, a cloud-powered service capability that uh, different applications, um, you know, on the web, mobile, etc., can then, uh, you know, link up to for uh, their production workloads, right? Like so, uh, how this finally works is if if you are, for example, uh, using a a home, uh, you know, um, voice assistant in your house, and you ask it to play a, a song, the the speech request will then be first sent up to the model in the cloud, and then your instruction will be passed, uh, probably through speech to text or something like that, and then the instruction will be executed, right? So that's the um, model and that's how AI models have generally worked until now. So after this, um, we enter section number three. And uh, now that we have a general basic understanding of this space, uh, one more quick look at how AI has been uh, until just a few months ago uh, before we look at the latest developments. And the reason I'm doing this is and the reason why this is important is because it helps us appreciate just how radical the latest set of developments are. Okay. So this is typically how AI, uh, you know, has been seen and classified. Uh, and I'm using Azure Cognitive Services just as an example, but it's largely the same across organizations, big and small, throughout the industry, right? Which means that we have um, uh, defined uh, different sets of capabilities uh, in the AI space and grouped them into logical buckets. Here we see them grouped according to cognitive function. Um, you know, just like humans have vision, speech, and language capabilities, uh, these AI models also, uh, you know, can help you recognize faces. If you're talking about vision, uh, can help you um, understand speech or transcribe speech. Can talk to you in natural uh, sounding voices uh, and also process language, and uh, you know, learn how to understand what you want. So, uh, just as some example, right? So. Um, and now let, let's take a look at uh, some of these models in action. So um, what happens is, um, let, let's take a look at this video first. This is one from the vision pillar where you're using, uh, you know, vision capabilities to um, run some surveillance in a supermarket. So what you see here is uh, that the AI is able to count the number of people in a store, or understand whether they're maintaining social distancing and the amount of time they're spending in the store, et cetera. And, and all of these are, um, you know, capabilities that have been developed uh, by the model provider, which is uh, Microsoft Azure in this case. And then there would be some, uh, you know, uh, integration provider who will use these models and then sell them to the supermarket chain, et cetera. And, and so you can see how uh, many different entities come together to provide this capability, right? So to summarize, um, you know, how things have been done until today, uh, here is, um, you know, a, a brief list of, uh, you know, key attributes. And so uh, the bottom line from here is that uh, until now, AI models generally would be built for enterprises, right? Which means that uh, uh, in this case, we have a vision model, which is sold to a intermediate company, which uses the models to develop applications that it then sells to a supermarket chain, you know, to use the same example. So it's built for enterprises and not directly accessible to lay persons, right? And second is the, the specificity. So models have a specificity, like we said, we saw it for vision, we saw models for speech and language, and, and they're uh, used to address specific use cases. And this has been the, the norm so far until now, right? Now, um, now we transition to the absolute cutting edge, and this is section number four, uh, very exciting uh, of the talk. And um, 
uh, we're now going to be able to contrast how AI has been uh, generally done until now with uh, you know the the new world that we're entering into, and we'll be able to compare the two. But when we're in the section, uh, we're going to be talking about um, Azure OpenAI, um, GPT, uh, Chat GPT, that is DALI model, uh, stable diffusion, uh, mid journey, and all of that goodness, right? So keep keep all of those uh, you know um, um, capabilities in mind as we go through the section. Basically. Uh, every AI product whose name you've heard for the first time in 2023. Okay, so keep those in mind. So we just saw a list, uh, you know, two slides back. Uh, remember the earlier two points that I mentioned, which is one, uh, enterprise focus, and second, specificity of models. Now let's see what's changed in the new world, right? So there's four points here. One is there's un unbelievable amounts of, uh, you know, data that these models have been trained on. Uh, second is that the models possess world knowledge, right? So again, to use uh, the cat and dog example, these models know what a cat and a dog looks like, right? You don't need to train them uh, with additional data anymore. They are valuable just right off the shelf, right? And uh, the other uh, important point is that you and I have actually used them. And uh, uh, by this, I'm referring to chat GPT, I'm referring to DALI, and uh, not just uh, so they're not meant only for enterprises they are although enterprises are still very much in the picture but they are also accessible to lay people and, and directly consumers most importantly so accessible via simple interfaces and uh, lastly uh, the models are generative in nature which means the outcome is not deterministic but open-ended right uh, which means that uh, and and, and multimodal uh, basically means the model can handle more than two types of data, which means it can handle maybe text and image together or text and speech or multiple different languages, et cetera. And so that's how you get models like DALI, which basically, uh, you know, like for example, converts text into images. So, so these are some of the Im important uh, distinctions between what has changed in the last few months versus how it has been for, uh, you know, a couple of years uh, before that. And we're going to double click on each of the points in the slides to come. Okay. So, like I said, point number one is about the increasing uh, size of these models. And that, I mean, there's a reason why they call large language models because they're trained on vast amounts of data. Some folks say, uh, you know, all of the uh, text, you know, uh, on the internet was used to feed into these models. I'm not too sure about that, but but it's a lot, right? Like, for example, the two. Notable um, examples here is one Turing NLG model, which was developed by Microsoft, had 17 billion parameters, right? And it was the largest model at the time and could do some, you know, brilliant, amazing things. But, um, you know, the, the change after that came in the form of GPT-3, which was not, you know, twice or thrice, but it was 10 times larger than Turing NLG, right? And such rate of growth is unprecedented. Even Moore's law talked about doubling of capacity every two years. This is increased by a factor of 10, right? Like, so it, it this, this space and this technology is growing at an, uh, you know, a remarkable rate. So that's point number one. Uh, for point number two, because we've all used chat GPT and probably DALI as well, I have not included demo, but we are all, uh, you know, very, very impressed with the amount of world knowledge these uh, models seem to have, right? And they can uh, synthesize our language and understand the way of communication uh, with no additional, uh, you know, training or input required at all. And this is like, this is huge, right? And so um, that's point number two, which distinguishes uh, the new set of AI from uh, what was available earlier. Number three is uh, uh, also the reason for this talk, which is that we are, um, able to use these uh, is that you and I have, uh, you know, been able to freely interact with these models. And this is also new. Uh, it was not available earlier, at least on this scale. And uh, the ability to easily interact with this new AI model has caused a real explosion of them into the mainstream, right? So that's point number three. And, uh, and lastly, we have uh, the fact that these are generative, which is that nobody can precisely, you know, tell the outcome. Uh, outcome is shaped by the quality of the input, right? And and uh, which is limited only by your creativity. So this really captured the world's attention and people were creating images, writing poems and whatnot. And so the generative aspect of the AI really, uh, you know, made it stand out from uh, anything we'd seen in the past. 
Awesome. So now that we've covered the, the state of the art and, and the cutting edge, um, we come to arguably the most important section of, of this uh, presentation, which is to um, address the question that was implied in the title of this talk, which is what do we do now, right? How should the design industry and designers think about these changes, um, you know, these technologies bring and the impact it will have on their work. So um, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on the same. Uh, and uh, I'm doing this by um, using a framework, you know, used by Satya and many other leaders uh, where they stepped back, uh, zoomed out and, and you know, uh, put this recent technological change in the context of the larger um, evolutionary arc that we've, uh, you know, all been on this, this one journey. So um, there are four um, key milestones in technology that are captured here uh, from the 90s to, uh, you know, uh, uh, today. And the fourth pillar is is hidden, but obviously obvious, uh, which is going to be generative AI and and the impact uh, each of these key milestones has had on the design industry and profession is what basically I've laid down on this particular slide. Um, and we're doing this because by studying these, uh, we might be able to better equip ourselves to adapt uh, to this, adapt and understand this latest you know set of developments and maybe uh, you know. Uh, prepare ourselves better to um, to go into this new future, right? So let's jump right in. Um, the first uh, milestone is the uh, the birth of the PC, and uh, the impact it had on the design industry was basically that design got digitized, right? You had tools uh, like Photoshop and Paint that got invented, GUI and its foundations were laid. And, and basically everyone, all design uh, profession moved to digital, right? Everything from typography to um, to graphic design became digital. And, and uh, therefore the real change in terms of what changed for designers was in the tooling. And uh, we all adopted uh, uh, software applications that helped us design, right? Like, so change in tooling was the main, um, um, you know, uh, takeaway from this particular first milestone. Now, 10 years pass and we have another major breakthrough, which is the um, arrival of the cloud and the, the real explosion of the, the web. And uh, this was basically the, the launch of the internet economy. Arguably, it had started in the 90s, uh, you know, um, in the US and elsewhere, but, but by 2000, it was a global phenomenon, right? And so um, you had a huge demand for user experience design and, um, I think the big takeaway for us uh, as designers was that it it really um, shaped our uh, philosophy of, of design. Design philosophy basically turned more user centric. It became more functional. It became more goal oriented uh, where, you know, your design was serving a certain purpose. Websites had a certain audience to cater to and so forth, right? Like so uh, research and ideation methodologies and, and all of this new work Right, and this vocabulary got invented, and we basically um, th that that was the key takeaway from this particular um, period. And now comes the uh, third um, key milestone, which was the uh, birth of mobile and smartphones, and so you had uh, basically. Uh, software which is now in our pocket there was a fragmentation of needs in the form of you know having an app for everything one for food one for play one for sleep etc and what this basically meant is and uh, that our design and interaction patterns that had evolved in in the web era now needed to um, you know be uh, reshaped and and optimized for a much smaller um, uh, surface area and this led to creation of new design and interaction patterns, uh, you know, such as uh, flat UI replace skeuomorphism, uh, the feed sort of, you know, uh, was really uh, taken to another level, even though it was invented on the desktop, uh, tiles and, and touch area became of consequence and, and, and gestures and gesture related, you know, uh, design also sort of, you know, became mainstream and and the impact of these uh, design patterns was felt not only in the the mobile space but also had spillover into 
into web, into desktop, into even I would argue publishing and other other spheres, right? So, so mobile had a real um, influence in shaping the language of design, and then uh, now we are at this uh, fourth key milestone, which is uh, the arrival of generative AI, and where does it take us from here, right? So, to answer this, let's uh, you know first try and understand its impact on the design industry and i think the most profound change uh, that this uh, uh, technology is going to cause uh, cause is that the cost of execution is now down to an absolute zero right everyone's an executor everyone can produce content uh, the skill barriers once required to create uh, you know uh, imagery or 3d or even animation as we saw are now completely destroyed right like so um uh, we have uh, we are going to have a massive explosion of content in the in the years to come right so that's that that part is quite evident now what this means for the design profession probably one is that it's again uh, you know the time for ideas is once again here uh, which means ideas are again more important than probably execution which seems somewhat controversial to say but uh, that's just how it is. Uh, it is going to be super easy to move across disciplines. One need not label oneself as, you know, maybe a industrial designer or an illustrator or a UX designer. It will be super easy to go from one discipline to another just because of the skill barriers having dropped. Um, that's one takeaway. So um, what I'm doing is I'm just capturing, uh, you know, key uh, changes we can expect here instead of being more prescriptive about, you know, uh, where uh, the design profession might be headed. So that's, these are some of the you know key inferences we can make. This is one. Second is another obvious one, which is design is now much more accessible and inclusive. Anybody who can type a few words can now design, which means more and more people will be entering the profession, which is awesome. Uh, another one is co-creation with AI, which is that you will now have, just like the plugins I showed in the beginning, you will have uh, the ability to talk to your favorite, uh, you know, design tools. And so imagine being able to talk to Sketch or Figma or your favorite Adobe program. And, and instead of having to know how to execute certain commands or, or how to use this tool in a particular, we can just ask the AI help helper to, um, you know, get uh, you the result that you want, which is, hey, I would like this to be merged with that, or I would like this to look a certain way. Could you help me get this done, et cetera? And so it's going to be a very different way of interacting with tools. And uh, some other examples are also, you know, the fact that you could have fictional um, AI user personas for testing, and that would maybe possibly eliminate or at least reduce the amount of human testing that we might do, possibly, right? And so how do we um, sort of sum up all of these changes? And it is somewhat, you know, uh interesting that uh, the label I, I chose to put on this again would be that this maximum amount of disruption seems to be happening in the tooling space uh which is similar to what happened in the 90s and so there's somewhat like a uh, a circular pattern here and uh, uh but yeah it seems like the the maximum disruption is going to happen in the in the tooling and 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 the uh, you know skill space and so and that's where we are and a little easter egg that i put at the end is basically the the next big milestone which i think we're still a little away from which is going to be ar and vr and and um, just to extend that joke a little bit i think the maximum disruption uh post ar vr is going to be in the design philosophy space again because we'll have to again once more redefine you know what it means to design in the vr space and and how do you design in 3d and all of that and so it's interesting that there is, you know, this continuity in 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 the sequence. But uh, yeah, uh, so with that, let me now close. And I just wanted to uh, play this one last um, video of a demo of Microsoft Designer app, uh, which has DALI now seamlessly integrated into the interface. I think it's a fitting illustration of, uh, you know, the future that we are headed into. So let me just go ahead and play that video.
Fantastic. Awesome. I hope you guys um, found that useful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suraj, for the wonderful talk. Every the entire design community was waiting to hear about this because this is one area which was troubling the designers a lot for last few months. And on behalf of the Typography Society of India, I would like to express our gratitude and appreciation for giving this talk. So now I will take uh, some of the questions from the audience. The first one is from a, a teacher's point of view, from uh, an academician's point of view. The first question is from myself. A few days back, I was in the department and walking and between classrooms and I saw there was one student who was doing a chat GPT on the screen. So I asked him. So he said, there is some course in some other place he was doing and the teacher there had given an assignment to write an essay on something and he was doing it in chat GPT, copying it and so. Then I was, uh, all of you know that, you know that uh, there are a lot of other AI tools. Once you finish with chat GPT, you can paste it there and then it will rephrase and so that the teacher will not be able to find out whether you have you know, AI generated output or not. So what, it, it draws a very scary picture to me as a teacher, where this education will go from here onwards. What will be the impact of this kind of AI and teaching as a profession? Is something which is worrying a lot of teachers. You know? Like now, uh, there are a lot of methods even to bypass, you know, turn it in and all that. So please, mm -hmm becoming a big issue. So can you throw some light on this? Yeah. Uh, firstly, Shriko sir, thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be, you know, connected to the design community once again. Uh, IDC was a big part of my life and I still have, you know, friends who are very dear to me in that time. So thank you so much uh, for having me here. Uh, I think it's a great first question to start with, honestly. And, and I think uh, embedded in that are sort of, you know, two uh, sub questions. One is around teaching, and the second question is around evaluation uh, of of skill. Right. Let's, so let's let's look at uh, it from those two lenses. On the teaching front, I think it's it's a much simpler um, you know um, a position uh, that we can have, which is that um, it sort of uh, you know frees us up in general to uh, find sort of better ways for the teacher student connect to happen, which is that. Uh, you know, all of these AI tools are now becoming ones where, um, uh, you know, what was once the effortful part of teaching, which is say dissemination of content or theory, et cetera, you know, you can have recorded lectures, you can have, uh, you know, even the basic uh, quizzes, et cetera, developed by, um, by, by uh, AI and software. And so that really leaves up, uh, or, or I should say, frees up a lot of time on account of the uh, the teachers to basically engage with students in a different way and, and I would argue in a much better way. So, for example, if you take a school, I you know, example, there are like lacks of school in the country and, and there are probably similarly lacks of teachers, but some of them are real superstars, right? And so if I'm able to now study from, uh, you know, a pre-recorded lecture from one of the superstar teachers, I can then actually have all of the other teachers who are physically present near me to do other things like maybe... Uh, you know, handhold a specific area where I'm weak in, or maybe, you know, answer, you know, doubts, uh, you know, per student, etc. And so the simple task of information dissemination now gets abstracted away by technology, right? So uh, I think in general, we are moving to a direction where uh, using AI is going to be a better, you know, relationship between teachers and, and students. So that part is, uh, you know, um, I, I believe quite a positive development. On the evaluation front, uh, it is, you know, raising a lot of uh, uh, concerns. And I believe nowadays in, in um, you know, answer sheets and question papers in exam halls, they are saying use of chat GPT, et cetera, is no longer, you know, not, not permitted, it's banned, et cetera. So uh, that's, that's really interesting. That is the, um, you know, juncture we are at, at as a society. And I think um, what's interesting there is um, to, to think of this as just yet another development in our in our tool capability, right? Like this is just a new tool. So back when, you know, like I said, 
uh, MS Paint or any other, you know, whenever there's an advancement in the kind of tools available, it sort of shakes up the, the status quo and people become afraid of, of, you know, oh, this tool is going to now uh, become a crutch or a handicap, you know, that 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 will make people not explore further or, or sort of, you know, take away from some of the uh, effort or human creativity. But what we generally see is that uh, we all sort of, you know, um, rise to a new bar where um, the, the, the tool gets integrated into the way we do things. And uh, what was once seen as an unfair advantage now becomes the new datum, right? And so once the tool is now commonly available to everyone, our way of assessing each other then sort of changes. And that's just the change we are going through. So if you, for example, are evaluating people on writing an essay, and now everyone has access to chat GPT, uh, you cannot have the same standards of, you know, testing students anymore. You, the, the, the faculty and teachers will now have to evolve uh, the next set of, you know, uh, parameters to define what is human skill and human creativity. And that is sort of, you know, making us a little um, uncomfortable, but that's just the change that has happened earlier also and will continue to happen. It's just a new uh, new normal that we are faced with, but I think we will reach a equilibrium steady state where we all, uh, you know, become okay with this latest set of tools. Thank you, Surud. But uh, one, another thing what is, you know, uh, I have as a teacher is that you know this learning process okay, or the teaching process together. You know? So, for example, you are teaching somebody about uh, sculpture, for example. So, I tell my students to write about or study the work of three Indian sculptors. Mm -hmm. So, minimum at least four sculptors work you you will search and see you know so this process of seeing other people's work and then selecting three of them observing their work studying from it and then writing down notes about them. all this is an experience you know? yeah. it is a very important it was an important part of learning yeah. that is the problem i face here is that that experience of a seeker going out, searching for things, and then, you know, observing and making inferences and then writing down, that is going to be, I mean, that is going to vanish. Yes. Because no. that chat, G, all this AI will do it for them. Okay. So as you said, that we cannot fight it, we have to accept it, it is a, that is the way it is going to be. So. I don't want to say that it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is going to affect the way we teach art and design. I think totally I'm I'm with you, Shiku sir, but uh, the only thought is, you know, like um, I think uh, Bing search and Google search have also been similarly villainized in the in the education sphere for a long time, right? Like where people said, if you can just enter a couple of keywords and get the information you're looking for, all of that deep research of you know going to the library pouring through books etc you know how is that um, you know how is a student ever going to experience that and i think there is some value in that there is value in being able to you know immerse yourself in a subject area there is value in being able to sort of let you know have the slow learning process happen to you so as you know these new tools develop i think it's also important to remember um, you know, um, the, the key experiences that one should go through and, and it doesn't mean that the latest and greatest tool is uh, arguably the better way of learning. And so some of our old traditional ways also we want to continue and take forward. So for example, even you might have DALI, but I hope the, uh, you know, the components in our design programs of sketching and all the fundamental skills that you're supposed to have, they still continue because they'll still, uh, you know, remain essential. So finding a balance is key there. I agree. You know, maybe I think it is a big challenge for teachers, academicians around the world. It will be for the next few years that how to create our own new grammar or, or new methods, you know. So we need to look at the whole thing all over again, how we teach. Yeah, I'll go to the next question. According to you, how is this going to impact the profession of design? Is it uh, a threat to designers or how will this affect different uh, specializations in design for example product design animation graphic design etc and what it's what are the limitations for example nowadays there are many websites where 
you just type in the name of your organization and what business do you do it will create a logo for you yeah so then what happens to a graphic designer whose bread and butter is that yeah. or how will it affect product designers or how will it affect animation so can you throw some light on that a uh, totally legit question and i think it's it's among the most important questions right now and very central to you know the the thesis of this talk and um, i can only best uh, you know restate the two points that you know uh, came to mind when i i, I thought about this um, this change and uh, uh, the first one is basically where i say that um, cost of execution is now down to zero and so your um, your craft your uh, you know skill ability all skill thresholds are effectively now you know totally gone because you can enter just a couple of words and you can have you know an image created you can have a logo created you can even have ui design you know just by entering a couple of uh, lines of text so where does that leave us you know and i think it's a real serious question to ponder over but uh, but um, uh, i don't think it's uh, you know necessarily a negative because uh, uh, one of the and this is coming to my second point which was i said uh, now once again ideas are more important than execution you know you used to have this phrase where ideas are 10% you know inspiration 90% perspiration you know i don't think anybody enjoys perspiration really you know you want to focus on all the nice juicy bits of you know those initial you know parts of the project where you're brainstorming ideas and it will be so amazing to be able to uh you know overnight not have one or two concept pieces but have a hundred you know to show to your client and and so i think instead of seeing this as a um uh, something that is going to change the ways of doing things earlier you should see this as a tool that empowers you so a graphic designer is no longer um you know um uh, they don't have to necessarily call themselves it's totally great to do that one you will be able to generate a lot more content than you earlier could number one and secondly we are all now freed up from uh, you know having to um, stick to one area where you might have developed a lot of you know um, um, uh, skill over time etc because uh, we can now move horizontally across from say graphic design to typography to ui design and and, and so forth and it will be very interesting to see how uh, you know folks with uh who have traditionally been in a certain discipline then when they move to another one or you know what outcomes they produce i think it's going to be a um a force multiplier rather than necessarily something that you know uh, threatens our our way of doing things because uh, you know it's basically a tool that will empower you so yes a little bit of anxiety because things are changing a lot and um, you know um, but but it's it's for the ones who are uh, like we say in microsoft you know if you have a growth mindset if you embrace this new change then then it's a very exciting future and it is uh, you know uh, time again when you can focus on ideas instead of having to you know spend a lot of time in execution so it's it's a net positive yeah okay next question is if an artwork is made by using elements of script visual and sound from various ai apps together how can we identify the originality and credibility of such an artwork very interesting question yeah uh, great question again and this is actually a, a big debate that is going on in uh, the space of ai because actually how these large models are trained is that somewhere deep down it's a bit of a black box even the most you know advanced researchers who are working on this don't necessarily just the way the brain is a bit of a mystery um, similarly these deep neural networks are also somewhat mysterious because we don't know exactly how a model comes to an answer right and and um going into that if if dali is able to produce images it is also because it has been fed you know um, 100000 images in as part of its training so uh where were the images taken from who should be given the credit about the original images that were taken etc you know and those are serious questions um because uh, ultimately what the new content that is being produced is a rehash of everything that it was fed right so now what you have is um, you know there are simpler example like for example quora the famous uh, question answer um, you know portal which is very popular among young people uh, has its own ai product now where all of the data comes from quora right so the outcome of um, you know those answers which are fed through the quora training data can be attributed to quora and quora gets the right and everything right but these other models where data has been scraped from all over the web uh you know then it's it's becoming hard to attribute this to anyone uh and and so it's somewhat of an open question but uh i i, I think uh, uh you know it'll it'll be less about 
uh, and this is another you know point I'm trying to drive to, which is that the steady state of where AI will end up is that it will not necessarily be the um, the primary uh, uh, you know protagonist in the project. So, for example, it's not like design houses are basically going to you know just be um, the intermediary between the AI you know uh, tools and the customer. You will have to have AI play the role of a helper and an assistant, and then you will have a human. Uh, you know, um, um, uh, a pass over the AI created, um, you know, base model, it could be artwork, it could be imagery, it could be sound, and the combination of uh, AI output, plus human moderation, human optimization, you know, human filters and changes to it will be the final outcome. And so the, the credit will somewhat be shared by the two. And it will not be that, uh, you know, it's just dumb, you know, engineering that is a product of a model anymore. So that's, that's where we will end up. Yeah. Okay. Next one is, what are the, according to you, how, since you are working in Microsoft, how this whole thing is going to uh, affect Microsoft or products of Microsoft? So I was just thinking, will it the day come when you open PowerPoint and I have to just tell, okay, create one uh, presentation on COVID and it will make. Oh, it's it's already there, sir. I, we are already there where uh, you're able to um, create a PowerPoint from a Word document. So that that is a demo we have already. So if you have a two-page paper on a certain topic, let's say COVID in this example, and you say, okay, convert this into a, a PowerPoint deck, it will take the, the entire long form text. It will uh, process it. It will chunk it into here are the key sort of, you know, themes in the deck. It will split it across a couple of slides. And based on the certain keywords present in the uh, pieces of text, it will now do a Bing search or it will use image generation like DALI to find imagery and it can actually end up with an entire PPT. So that's actually a capability we have, uh, you know, right away. So um, yes, just like in the design industry, I think even in, uh, in the workplace, in in uh, you know among knowledge workers, all of the things that we would do traditionally are now you know shaking up in a big way, and so we all have to adjust. Uh, but but to answer your question about how is MS thinking about AI, we are you know massively doubling down on this. Um, our AI models actually um, the AI models that we produce and have been making for years, we are among the biggest consumers of this. So if you use for example um, dictation in office, or if you use read aloud on the edge browser where you're listening to a piece of news instead of you know reading it etc all of this is using our ai models be it speech to text be it text to speech etc and so uh, we are among the biggest uh, you know um, integrators of our own ai models and so now in fact with uh, bing it has now you know chat gpt integrated into it and and open ai models are also in, so so in bing in edge in windows we are all infusing ai in a number of places and and, and i think that's the direction we are headed to where um, it's, it's a bit of an exaggeration but from your car to your toaster you will have ai embedded in all products and it will be fine it will not be a crazy world you'll not be in some you know chaotic future but uh, you'll just have ai assistance available you know wherever you need it and that's the future that you know we are headed towards and microsoft is you know trying to get us there sooner so yeah so it is going to impact a lot of your products like excel and word and all that Absolutely. In fact, in Excel, for example, you can take a picture. If you have a table drawn by hand on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard, you can take a picture and it will um, digitize that text and it converts it into an Excel sheet. So we already have that. Yeah. So we have a lot of other questions. One is that will AI replace human jobs in future? I think we have already answered it in yeah. the earlier ones. Yes. And according to you, what are the limitations of this AI created output? Correct. I think it's great to talk about limitations because in all this hype, you know, where people are, you know, worried about, you know, jobs being stolen or uh, us moving to a very, um, you know, cold, you know, um, unromantic future. It's not the case. I think uh, AI, even in its modernity and, you know, it's, it's, it's quite brilliant in what it can do, but uh, it's still very, you know, nascent in the sense that, uh, for example, this uh, very popular model called, um, there's this Chinese game called Go, right? And so there was a model that was created which could beat this, uh, which could beat a human in the game of Go. And it was a big piece of headline about three years back, right? And, and you think once uh, AI has understood how to play Go or chess, then, you know, there's no going back. And of course, now it is, you know, 10,000 times better than a human, etc. But what happened just about a month ago or so is that 
they found, uh, you know, an Achilles heel in how the AI models sort of understand the game. And actually the AI models are not, you know, uh, these sentient beings as we imagine them to be. In fact, when it plays chess, it doesn't even understand what a chess board is, what chess pieces are, etc. It just knows A2 to C4, you know, D5 to C6 or whatever, right? Like, so it's just got an optimization function. It doesn't understand anything around the world. So the point is the Go example, um, they found a fatal flaw and uh, a human could once again, three years later, beat the latest, you know, most advanced AI models that were, that, were, that were playing Go. And not only that one program by Google, but then all of the other Go programs in the world all had the similar flaw, right? Uh, and similarly, Chat GPT got launched, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. And while it can produce some pretty amazing results, uh, you can also see it fail in so many ways, right? Like, for example, even basic multiplication of four digits, etc. It doesn't do well because it's not been trained as such. So our simple calculator is, you know, from 30 years ago is more powerful in some sense than this. So we don't have to worry about, you know, uh, these models being uh, all knowing, you know, all powerful. It's it's just that they um, are very, you know, capable in certain narrow uh, scenarios. They do certain specific things very well. And that's great to have as a co-pilot or a helper, which is the, the state that these AI models are going in. And, and um, that's where we'll see them go. It's it's not that um, they're becoming all intelligent or all powerful anytime soon. Yeah. So they fail all the time, basically. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have another question. For example, this logo makers or logo creators. Okay. So what happens 10 of us in 10 different locations are typing the same question at the same time design a new logo for Microsoft. So the all 10 of us will get the same logos or they will be, they will be different? Yeah, so no, it's very interesting. They they might be different. So let's assume they, they're all using the same product. In this case, the DALI model. Uh, um, even there, you know, like, um, again, the, the exact way in which the model produces an outcome is not known. These are not deterministic models. It is generative AI. And uh, in these models, for example, they not only ask you for that prompt, but ask you what style you would like it. And you could have it in cartoon style, you could have it in realistic, you know, for whatever, like, you know, classical style, etc. So uh, our, our prompts could be different, but um, uh, to that specific point, if we, um, you know, uh, use the exact same prompt, then we would get very similar answers, but there would still be some variability in them. Yeah. And from a student's viewpoint, okay. So I would like to ask this thing about from a, how this is going to affect a student's life. For example, there was a time when the basic arithmetic skills were taught in schools. But today, when you have access to a calculator, we are all very used to uh, using a calculator. So we slowly, slowly, we are losing this basic arithmetic skills because we have got access to technology. Like that, now AI has come, there are a lot of things in school, activities in school, where a student has now access to all this. There are 100 other alternatives to chat GPT. Yeah, many of them can help them create an output which no teacher can ever find out whether they have written or is it from somewhere else. So how is it going to affect the student, the young children who are studying in schools now, yeah. when they come out, will there be a scenario where without internet and when if you are given a piece of paper and pen, you won't be able to write a sentence properly uh, with a good grammar. In it. So that is yeah, some... No, um, she was a fair question. I also uh, think it's a genuine cause of worry because what you need as uh, sort of, you know, well-rounded adults is that there must be a certain competence in all of the key, um, you know, skills you need to have as an adult, you know, basic comprehension, be it language comprehension, be it some math ability, be it some, you know, and and uh, it's, it's, it's a known fact that studying different subjects, you know, trains the brain uh, in, a, in different ways, you know, and so this whole experience of 12 years, different types of subjects, etc., this makes us, you know, well sort of rounded, uh, you know, and skilled individual. And so there is genuine fear, like, I mean, just to give a simple example, um, you know, I, I I did use landlines, you know, till, you know, sometime back I was in school, but then soon we got mobile phones, etc. Nobody remembered mobile numbers anymore, right? But my father in his time has, you know, uh, memorized maybe hundreds of numbers and, and he can sort of, you know, recount Sanskrit shlok, etc. And his memory is generally better, I see, than, than, you know, my ability to remember. And so there is a very real fear of 
uh, us missing out on certain key uh, cognitive, uh, you know, experiences. And so, uh, say, doing maths with the pencil and on, on pencil and paper, doing reading comprehension, etc. Those are essential skills, and I hope those continue because. Uh, let's not embrace everything modern as good and everything traditional as bad. That will be a bad way to do it. There are some essential experiences that are still important if you're a design student or if you're a student in the classroom. And I hope those continue. And the, the policymakers and, you know, um, uh, influencers such as yourself come up with a balanced approach where we embrace the new, but also don't forget some of these, uh, you know, older um, exercises that helped us uh, develop, uh, you know, a rounded skill set. So, yeah. <laughs> We have a very interesting question from, from Jay Menon, sir, professor of design. He's asking, is your presentation today AI enabled? Uh, <laughs> one, one question I, I want to make sure is this um, uh, Tulsi's uh, father, Jay Menon? Oh, lovely. Okay. So I want to thank him first because I think he's partly the reason why we're having this talk. Yeah, I am also, yeah, I yeah. want to thank him because, <laughs> because of his initiative, we could yes. get this thing done and the entire design community was actually looking forward to a lecture on this talk. Correct, correct, correct. So his daughter Tulsi actually leads the AI practice in Microsoft. I'm part of her team and, you know, we're just um, very, very happy to be at this, in this team at this time where so much, you know, there's so much action all around. Uh, but to, to his question, um, I don't know, I, I don't think so, but I mean, I've done some AI talks in the past where uh, I did use chat GPT, this was back in December, where I said, uh, how do you think I should open this presentation? And it gave me a, you know, like it gave me great suggestions. It said, please start with demos. They're an exciting and fun way to open a talk. And so I did follow, you know, chat GPT's instructions. So in some way, yes, today's talk is also shaped by, uh, you know, AI. And that is true. <laughs> so that is why normally I don't read out the name of the person who asked, but this one is special. So I thought I will tell you. And then to be frank, to be, before I made the introduction video for you, I also checked in chat, chat GPT how to introduce Surat personally. <laughs> oh, God. So some right. points, but it was very generic. Like, you are a very good leader. You have done a lot of projects like that. It was a very surface. I, I will take it, sir. I will take that description. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I did search for it and it gave a reasonably good, well written. So, but, yeah, let me, I mean, uh, to not be very shameless about it, but uh, the Bing integration in chat GPT is actually not as simple as just plugging in the same chat GPT. You know, the teams uh, at work have done a lot of uh, additional, uh, you know, tech innovation to uh, say, for example, if you ask something like, you know, what is the height of Kutub Minar? You know, it it does a bunch of complicated things where the the spec the exact prompt is not fed to Chat GPT. You know, it is broken down into multiple prompts. There is a search done to understand what Kutub Minar is. Then you go to the Wikipedia page and you say, okay, you're asking for height, etc. And so um, there was a lot of work that went into sort of producing uh, this new Bing. And and what you get is uh, like for example, Chat GPT has a limitation of. I think 2021 is the latest data that it was trained on. So if you ask it a 2022 question, it, it sort of fails. Whereas the new Bing actually um, sort of, you know, is fed uh, fresh data that is relevant to your query in real time. And therefore you get a combination of, uh, you know, updated, con continuously updated data. And then it, it sort of also processes it with the world knowledge it has been trained on. So it's quite superior and, and uh, I would highly encourage everyone to try it out. You know, it's in preview right now. Yeah. Okay, we have come to the time limitations now. I want to thank you uh, on behalf of Typography Society of India. And it is a pleasure to meet an alumnus of IDC. And uh, it was a very small world. I was very surprised when <laughs> the announcer said that the speaker is my student. Yeah. So it was a very small world. And uh, I would like to thank the team of HasGeek. And I would like to thank uh, my students, Jinal Shah and Umang, for helping me out with the q and Thank you very much. And we will conclude the session from here. All the best, Surat. Looking forward to more updates on AI from you. Yes. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Namaste. Jai Hind.